you're live. Hey everybody, how is it going? Uh, it is Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, at least here in Georgia, and that means uh, it is time once again for another episode of the Cult of Copy show, uh, where we talk about persuasion, manipulation, mind control, influence, and uh, marketing, and all of that fun stuff, which hopefully everyone listening to the show is not too creeped out by, or else you wouldn't be here. Uh, I'm your host, as usual, the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin DiTerio, founder of the Cult of Copy, which, uh, as of last week, has over 10,000 members. Woo! Very proud of that. Uh, we are a worldwide organization, as I said, dedicated to discussing uh, the topics that I mentioned at the top of the show. If you go to the URL under my face right now, cultofcopy.com, that currently redirects to a Facebook group, which you can request to join. And unless your Facebook profile looks like bullshit, I'll probably let you in. But uh, at some point in the near future, as I keep saying over and over, and it never happens yet, one day that URL will point to a website. From that website, you should be able to get to this show anyway, as well as the group. So if you're listening to this at some far-flung future date well beyond August 14, 2014, and that URL doesn't go straight to a Facebook group, don't flip out. It's still me, because I own that domain, so don't worry about it. That said, uh, good to see you all this week. Let's see, I, I talked about me, I talked about the cult, I talked about the show. Oh, the show. So you're watching the show. As I said, we record new live episodes Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. However, at this very URL where you should be watching the show right now live, uh, you can watch this episode at a future date whenever you feel like it because the URL will be the same thing and that's where the recording will be. Uh, you may notice that as part of a YouTube channel, Cult of Copy, uh, channel is uh, youtube.com slash cult of copy uh, you can subscribe there to the channel get notifications when we're doing new live recordings of episodes and of course watch all previous episodes this is episode 17 so as you may expect there are indeed 16 other full episodes but a bonus one also because we did an episode 0 so if you have like 17, 18 hours to spend watching me talk about this kind of stuff feel free. We got tons and tons of content for you. If you like it, if you like it, subscribe, share it, tell people about it, bring your friends. We would love to have you. Uh, as always, our director, Zane, is uh, in the control booth taking care of keeping an eye on the comments. So if you leave a comment on the YouTube page where you are watching this or on any of the Facebook posts that I made about the show or also on the Google Plus page for this episode, Zane is keeping an eye on it, and we will try to interact live on the internet, and I will answer your questions if you have any about the show. Uh, even if you are commenting after the show is all d said and done, we do keep an eye on those. So if you have any questions, follow-ups, comments, uh, even if you watch the show and you find the particular tidbit tantalizing, I will tell you a secret. If you post a comment and say what part you liked and why and leave the timestamp, where that part occurs, Zane, our director, loves to go and pull clips out of full episodes, so he will grab that clip and make a short video just of that part. So he works for you, basically. If you like a part of a show and you would like a short little video clip of it, I don't know, to share and tell people how awesome the show is, go ahead and put the timestamp in a comment, and Zane will take care of it for you. That's all the show business we have. Uh, Zane, real quick. Uh, do you want to uh, talk about Gtron on Google Plus? Um, I keep mentioning Zane as our director, and he is uh, super adept at running Google Hangout shows and things like that. And he teaches people how to do it, so he can tell you about his group really quickly before we get into uh, this week's episode. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so over on Google Plus, I have a Google Plus community uh, where all the the nerd folk hang out and talk about the um, Hangouts. YouTube, Google+, and even AdWords for video because uh, that just seems to be the, the discussion that's going around. So uh, hop over. It's uh, called uh, uh, Gtron Marketing, right, for all the nerd references out there. Um, so, yeah, come on over if you're interested about that, uh, and uh, we'd love to have you because uh, this, this wave of, of Hangouts and, and Hangout shows and, and things like that are, are just barely starting, so we need more people who are interested in that. So come on over. Yeah, if you, if you like uh, my show and uh, what I do, 
uh, Zane is the guy who taught me how to do it and even made me aware that such things were possible. So if you like the format, think it would be cool with something you have in mind, you want to do something similar, it doesn't have to be like a full broadcast show like I do. Maybe you just want to do a little recording or something for your own community. Uh, it works for that too, but Zane is the expert. Like I said, even though I tell you to come to the Cult of Copy for the content of the show, if you want to get all meta and say, hey, I want to ask a bunch of questions about that show, I'm, I'm not going to know the answer, so you should join Zane's community if that's what you're into. So if you saw the promo that we did this week, which I'm very proud of myself for coming up with the idea on Monday instead of the past few weeks where I come up with it like Wednesday at midnight and send nice it over to Zane. Um, this week we are going to talk about something that I actually did uh, a full newsletter about before, and I've done uh, talks about it before, and I even did on my show from a couple of years ago, Passion, Persuasion, and Profit, I did a full episode about what we're going to talk about today, which is what I call the bellwether effect, um, which literally just made me remember I forgot a prop that I needed, but hey, whatever, it's a live show. That's what's fun about coming. Anyways, don't worry about it, because I remember what I need to say, even without the prop. That, that makes oh. me think of how you ended uh, last week's episode. And you were like, we're like, we can just end it whatever we want. We don't have to do the full out. That's right. We ran out of stuff to talk about, so we're done. Yeah. Anyways, uh, hopefully we'll fill the whole hour this week. Uh, I did write down, like, double the amount of crap that I wrote down for last week. So, um... We're going to talk about this thing called the bellwether effect, and what it has to do with is uh, everyone has heard the term sheeple, right? It's a portmanteau of sheep and people, and uh, if you have to go look up what the word portmanteau is uh, as part of this video, you should leave a comment to let me know because I like expanding people's vocabulary. Anyway, using context clues, portmanteau. It's sheep and people smashed together into one word. Sheeple, right? Everyone has heard that term. It's sort of meant to be a derogatory term to a specific type of person that maybe is just not too into making their own decisions for themselves, and they just sort of follow what the flock of other sheeple are doing, right? The trick with this is everyone is sheeple, right? Like, when people use that term, they mean, like, those other people, not me. I'm not a sheeple. Those people are sheeple. Bullshit, right? We're all chimpanzees in shoes. We're not all that smart, right? Everyone is part of some kind of flock. And the way to think about it, if you know what a Venn diagram is, where you have, like, here's this group, and here's that group, and here's where they overlap. You know, it's two circles that intersect. Well, flocks of people exist that way conceptually around all kinds of things at multiple times. So you might be, like, a political sheep because you're in a particular flock and you're more than willing to let that flock's group opinion dictate to you what your opinion is. Politics is one. Religion is one. Uh, fandoms are one. So like if you're part of a fan community about a particular TV show and everyone in, that's a fan of that show is like, well, we think this episode is the worst and it's the suckiest and fuck the guys that made it. How dare they make this free entertainment for us, those jerks? <laughs> If you're in that kind of community, a lot of times there's pressure to accept what the group norm is. No matter who you are, there is some you're you're in someone's flock, right? So there's no escaping it. So that's the first point I want to make about sheeple is that when I talk about it, I'm not talking about those guys, those dumbasses that don't think for themselves. Like no one's immune. We're all in some flock or other usually many flocks all at the same time. For Like your family, think of your family as a flock. You may not agree with them, but there's no doubt that they're heavily influential on you and the things that they do affect your behavior. You're in that flock whether you like it or not. That would just be an example. So we're all sheeple. That's the point there. Now, the trick with sheeple is that most of the time when marketers talk about like marketing to the flock, marketing to the herd mind, there's two different schools of thought about the way to do that. And generally speaking, the first school of thought is like, it's about getting the money. So it's like a bonus if they're okay with having given you money. It's like a happy accident, you know? Hey, if we can like make them happy about it, that's great. But number one, get the money. That's more of a wolf 
perspective, if we're continuing the sheep, sheep metaphor, right? Because they want what the sheep's got, and they're willing to take it, and they don't care if the sheep continues to exist after that because they are more than willing to move on to the next sheep, right? So the wolf eats the sheep. Now, it's important to note, like, the wolf has as much of the sheep as he wants, right? But then he's done with it, and he moves on. So he gets, like, a bigger share because he's more aggressive, but then he needs a new sheep, right? The alternative to that would be the shepherd. And the shepherd would be your nice, hippie, mumbo-jumbo guru who he just wants to help you out. It's all about you. What are your goals? I'm a total servant to you. 100% of everything you're doing, that's what I'm about. I'm here to help you. And I'm not saying that's a fake perspective because some people are really like that. But it's... There's no way around the fact that people who deliver from that standpoint make themselves separate from the herd, right? So even though they're nice, it's like, I'm better than you, but I feel real good about myself for helping you out. There's no way to avoid that. And the reason I, rec I say that is because if you're thinking of positioning yourself that way, it's important for you to know that this is a perspective some portion of your audience will have. They will see that wall of separation if you condescend to them that way. The trick with the shepherd is, the way the shepherd thrives is he takes products of the sheep, if you will. He, he fleeces them, but he does not kill them. He shaves them down, and they're sort of happy about it. There's some benefits to being shorn down when you're a sheep and the sun's hot. You got all that wool off of you. It's nice. You can run around, frolic, and eat grass and whatnot. But you come back again and again to the shepherd because the shepherd sort of cares for you and gives you a little bit of benefit. You can think of it instead of a, a predatory, parasite-like relationship, it is a symbiotic relationship, right? You, you work with each other. You benefit each other when you do it that way. Now, the shepherd has a problem in that for whatever reason it's a harder sell sometimes to the sheep than what the wolf has. And it's because the shepherd is sort of obligated to be honest because they don't want to mislead the sheep, right? So the shepherd's like, here's what's going to happen. It's like not like Super Bowl or you're not like free to do whatever you want. You're still part of my herd, but I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do right by you. I'm not going to mislead you. It's going to be fine. Whereas the wolf is like, screw that guy. It's way awesome over here. You can make like $10 million immediately. And blah, 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 right? Because the wolf can lie. He doesn't care because what are you going to do? He's already got your money and he's done with you, right? So a lot of times that's why the wolf can be more seductive than the shepherd because automatically he can be more intriguing to the sheep because he's, he's not obligated to tell the truth. He can say whatever he wants, true or not, right? So that's a big problem with the, the wolf mentality compared to the shepherd mentality. Now, for a long time, at the very beginning of my career in marketing when I was still an employee writing sales letters for a company that I worked for, that, that dichotomy was very important because we were, were a company that sold training to people who owned e-commerce websites to say, here's how you get educated in SEO and how to apply it and if you want to staff up and here's how we're doing it with our own e-commerce sites, here's how we recommend you do it, that kind of thing. But as the writer for that company, that, that dichotomy between the shepherd of this flock and the wolf was something that I worked with a lot. Because if you've, if you've heard me talk before about uh, creating engaged communities of customers, I've told you before how it helps to have a villain, right? A bad guy that you can say, that guy is who you don't want to be. And we don't want to be that guy. We all hate that guy over here. So if you hate that guy, now you're in our club automatically. That's sort of why it's valuable to have a villain, something just horrible to single out that you're definitely not part of. So people can agree that they are, at least in part, on your side of something, right? So that whole shepherd and wolf separation was something that I used a lot to say, you know, you can be a shepherd or a wolf, and there's a lot of guys out there being wolves. We're shepherds. 
here's why, right? So I use that metaphor a lot, and um, I can't remember what year it is. I want to say like 2010 maybe. Uh, it might even have been 2009. Uh, I went on vacation with my wife uh, in Mexico. This is before we had kids. Um, and we were on the beach, and I was reading the science fiction novel called uh, Bellwether, which is, you know, it's called the Bellwether Effect, what we're talking about today. Uh, it's by this lady, Connie Willis. If you've been watching since the beginning of the show, and I was like, man, I forgot a prop. I have the book. It's like in my house over there. I'm not going to get up and go get it now because I don't know what shelf it's on. I meant to look for it earlier. Anyway, I still own the paperback. I don't want you to confuse me talking about this book, Bellwether by Connie Willis, as a recommendation for the book. It was labeled as a science fiction book. It's more of a romance book. It's sort of like if you had called Twilight a horror book and you picked it up thinking it was a horror book and you read it and you're like, what the fuck is this? There's vampires, but I'm not scared. Um, anyway, it's one of those, right? So it was like labeled as a science fiction book, but it's more of a romance novel for science fiction nerds. It wasn't terrible. It just wasn't what I wanted, and I'm like on the beach in Mexico, and I only brought so many books. I didn't own a Kindle at the time, so I'm like, I fucking wasted space in my suitcase bringing this stupid book. I may as well read it. Anyway, I'm glad I did because I got this thing that I've been making mileage off of for years now, as I said. So here's the idea with this book, The Bellwether. Basically, it's a scientist... The, this group of scientists in a think tank, I think they're somewhere in like Montana or something, and they're studying various things, and they work for like corporations, right? So their idea is to do these psychological experiments and come up with reasons to do different marketing techniques or not. The main character of the book is working on theories and mathematical algorithms that pertain to fads and trends with the idea that if she figures out what causes them and how they propagate, marketing companies can create them on purpose, right? That should make sense to everybody. So you can see how, even though it's a romance novel and I didn't really care for it, it had some good, like, it was in my wheelhouse, just not the right genre. So anyway, I kept reading this book. There's another dude at this facility who is doing some experiment with sheep. And I don't remember what his actual experiment with, with the sheep is. There's a part in the book where he explains what a bellwether is. Now, the whole setup of me telling you I got this from a novel is because I don't want to argue with anyone who's like a sheep farmer who's going to tell me my idea of what a bellwether is is completely wrong. I got it from a stupid novel. The idea is what's important. So if you can agree with me right there that if this description of how sheep behave is bullshit, doesn't matter. It's the metaphor that's important. So pretend it's true. I promise it's still useful because I know it works. I've been living this model for the past several years. I'm living proof that it works. That's why I'm telling it to you today. So here's the deal with the bellwether, right? So you have a flock of sheep and not like metaphorical sheep, but we're talking about actual sheep now. Uh, they're sheep, right? So like who knows what a sheep is thinking? You have a herd of sheep, a flock, right? And they move however they're going to move, and they usually move as a group. Now, if you're a shepherd, it's obviously very beneficial to know where that flock is going to move, right? So you would think, well, I want to figure out what the leader sheep is, and then that way I know what, I watch him, and then I know which way the sheep are going. Makes sense, right? That way you get to fla follow the flock around. You being the shepherd, you kind of want to keep tabs on them and know where they're going. The trick with sheep is they're so dumb that they are incapable of identifying a leader among their flock and following that leader willingly. What happens is a sheep's default behavior is I'm going to do what I'm doing right now until something interesting pops up, meaning the sheep on the side of me started doing something different. And then I'm going to be like, well, shit, I'm going to do, do what that sheep does. To go back to what we were talking about, to switch back to the metaphor where we're talking about sheeple, everyone's like, I don't do that. I'm an individual. I'm not influenced by what other people do. Um, there's this book, The True Believer, written by Eric Hoffer, and he talks about mass movements. Uh, there's a quote. I'm not sure if it's from that book, but I know Eric Hoffer said it, but that when people are given the freedom to do what they want, they're most likely to just imitate other people. 
that is 100% true. You can observe it every single day of your life, even if you give a little bit of self-reflection in yourself, right? So going back to sheep, that's kind of what the sheep do, right? Like, as soon as a sheep on the side of them starts doing something different that looks more interesting, they're like, I'm going to do that. So in the herd of sheep, there's one sheep that gets bored fastest, and he's the first one that's like, I'm, I'm bored of eating this grass. Like, this sucks. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go eat that grass over there, right? He's just the first one to get bored. He's not trying to be the leader. He's not like the alpha sheep that's like, all these sheep ladies are mine. He's just, for genetic reasons, whatever the case is, he's the one with the shortest switch for like, this is boring, I'm doing something else. Because he's the first one to move, the sheep behavior ripples through the herd, radiating outward from that one sheep. Because they're like, that guy's doing something different, I'm doing what that guy does. And then the other sheep around that sheep are like, that guy's doing something different, I'm doing what that guy does. The thing is, he's not in front of the herd leading them, he's in the middle. So what you need to do as a shepherd is identify which sheep is the one that gets bored first and takes action and then put a bell around that sheep's neck because a wether is a castrated male sheep and the bell wether is the one that's wearing the bell. He's the one who moves first. All the other sheep follow him. He's not in front. He's in the middle. So you just listen to where the bell goes and then you can follow the herd of sheep. Everyone hopefully follows so far. The bellwether is the leader of the sheep. He doesn't even know he's the leader. The other sheep don't even know he's the leader. He's just the one who moves first. Everyone moves to imitate him. He's a trendsetter without even being aware that he's a trendsetter. This is one of those ideas in this book. I don't even remember how the book ends. I don't remember the characters. I barely remember the scenario only because I've told this story over and over. Never reread it. Read it that one time on the beach in one day in Mexico. This is the one idea I retained. And I kept it, and I wasn't sure why. And it's because it integrates into this model of the shepherd and the wolf among the sheeple, right? So to add one more layer to this before we describe how a bellwether can be among the sheeple and become a leader on purpose, unlike an actual bellwether in real life, Someone asked in the Cult of Copy when I first posted this topic, when I talked about the wolf and the shepherd and the bellwether, they're like, what about sheepdogs? And I'm like, the sheepdogs work for the shepherd. And I just said that, like, flippantly to say, well, you know, of course they work for the shepherd. They are on the shepherd's side. And, you know, I'm like, this isn't part of this metaphor. Quit being stupid, basically. Sorry, whoever I, I dismissed in that way because I've thought about it more. And there is a role for people that I would call sheepdogs. And these are people who are veterans in the niche but are not necessarily wolves or shepherds themselves. And they're the people who are like, these are the guys who are cool to follow and those are the guys that suck and will rip you off. And they're not experts in themselves, but they are like advocates, evangelists. They're like the people sitting in groups on Facebook or forums or whatever that are just always there, they have tons of posts, they're educated and informed, but they are not experienced because they are not either a shepherd or a wolf, they're just a sheepdog. They're like, those guys are good, these guys are bad, that's what I would do. But when they say that's what I would do, that's not backed up by personal experience, they're just fans of the niche. That's not to disparage it, it's a legitimate role. If you're well educated in a particular topic, your opinion is valuable. I'm just pointing out that you're not living off of the group you're a part of. You're still just a member of it altruistically, but you're like a veteran sheep, basically, even though you're a sheepdog. You do basically work for the shepherd because you're like, sheep, that guy is the boss. Don't listen to the wolf. The shepherd is the guy who knows what's up. So that is a legitimate role. Thank you for bringing that up because you have expanded my model in a way I had not previously thought about. But when we go back to the bellwether, the trick with being a bellwether is you can be a bellwether in an online community on purpose. And if you've been a member of a lot of different online communities, which I have because I'm one of those weirdos that I get like a new hobby I'm deeply interested in for like six months, and then I just move on to another thing. 
spend motor scooters, comic books, role-playing games, collecting records, all kinds of dumb shit that I get into really intensely for a short amount of time. And a lot of times I'll revisit it, so that's nice. It's like when I buy like 4,000 records while I happen to be into records. I'm going to listen to them later. I'm not super intense about it right now, but I'm glad I have them. So it's one of those kind of things. It's cyclical. But because of that, I get involved in a lot of online communities as a member. And there are always bellwether figures in these communities where they're not hanging up a shingle and saying, I'm the boss. I'm the expert. Here's my experience and my authority. Here's why you should listen to me. They're just such pillars of the community, and they're so plugged in and so ubiquitous, again, another vocabulary word for you, but ubiquitous means you're everywhere. Um, so ubiquitous in their niche that they get respect because people are like, well, that guy's everywhere and he's plugged in. His opinion must be worth something, right? The degree to which they participate in the community is taken to mean they have a modicum of expertise or at least longevity and some degree of knowledge so that their opinion is valued more. Now, that's kind of what an organic bellwether is, and they're influential, but not very effectively. They could be if they did it on purpose, but they're not aware that they've been granted this bellwether role. So a lot of times, they aren't sufficiently broadcasting their own behavior in a way that the rest of the audience can pick up on. If they were, it would. They would have more of a following. So sometimes when these bellwether figures in an online community say they have a blog or like a Tumblr or a Twitter account or something where they're broadcasting, they quickly develop a huge following and become a little celebrity in their niche. Why is that? Well, it's because they're being a bellwether in that they move first, but they're giving off signals so that the sheeple around them can detect that they're making a change, that they're giving their attention to something, that they're having an opinion form, and then the people around them that just want to Im imitate what they do have something to follow. They have something to imitate, and therefore these people build up audiences organically. But the ones that are just sort of like part of the community that don't even realize they they would have followers if they would just do something that other people could follow, they're just less effective, right? So hopefully everyone follows so far. You have the bellwethers that are terrible at it because they don't even realize it, and therefore when they do move, they don't tell anyone. And then you have the people that sort of accidentally figure it out because maybe they just like to write or post or they're just sociable people. They end up with a following as a bellwether, but they don't understand why because it's just a coincidence of being... Uh, an outgoing person who shares what they're doing and that combined with them being in an engaged niche where they happen to be an early mover people sort of line up behind them a lot of times you'll you'll get people like this uh, in the professional field and they're very successful but they're absolutely terrible at explaining to you why they might be successful because they didn't do it on purpose it's just some combination of their natural talents and accidental opportunities and they just sort of did what they were going to do anyway, and it happened that a bunch of people liked it and maybe gave them a bunch of money, and voila, you're successful. They had no plan. They can talk about it, but they're just making shit up after the fact because they didn't have a plan up front. They can't show you the plan that they had to do that on purpose. So if you've ever encountered people like that and you're like, I don't understand that. Is the dude just really lucky? That's what happened is they happened to hit a crowd where they were an early mover and they also happen to be a natural broadcaster. So a successful bellwether in a flock of sheep, to go back to the real example, all the other sheep can see him, so he's automatically a good broadcaster, right? He's got that part covered. He moves faster, but that's just a quirk of genetics. It's not like he's trying to do it, that he just gets bored the fastest accidental. He's not doing it on purpose. He doesn't pretend to be aware of it. So looking at that, if you want to do that artificially, if you want to embody that role as a person and go into a community and be a member of that community, but have the community see you as a leader and become an influential figure without positioning yourself that way, without like 
pulling out your soapbox and standing above everyone or trying to be a shepherd to them or trying to be a wolf to them. If you want to learn how to do that as a person, that's what we're going to talk about in a minute. But right now, it's halfway through the show. And that is where we would have a commercial if I were accepting advertisers yet, which I'm not. Because pretty soon we're going to be a podcast and there's going to be a much bigger audience and I don't want to take someone's money for an early episode that might not get as much play. But I haven't done that yet. But if I did, this is the spot in the show where you could be a paid sponsor. So if you like the content of the show, you think our audience would respond well to your product or service, talk to me about it. We'll work something out and I will talk about your product or service on this show as long as it's cool. I'm not going to talk about something crappy. But we work out a deal so that I can talk about what you have to offer the community that I have. It's a win-win, right? Zane has his hand up. Yeah. Well, uh, I was I was gonna recommend maybe you should talk about the the discussion we had last night that you were a part of. Maybe. Oh, um, sure. Well, I I just showed up as a favor to you, to be honest, and I don't really know what it's about. But if you want to talk about it, go ahead. All right. Cool. Uh, so. This is this is what Colin was a part of last night. Uh, this is uh, five five nights of uh, eight different marketers getting together and talking about different topics. And this was last night, which was copywriting funnels and persuasion. And Colin was there, gave a lot of really good advice. In fact, I'm going to be taking parts of uh, parts of that discussion for Colin and posting it on the YouTube channel here because. You know, YouTube's awesome like that. So, uh, just want to let everybody know there's there's going to be a few more nights. There's tonight and there's uh, tomorrow night and Saturday night, and it's going to be much like this. You see Todd Gross right here. Todd Gross is a part of the panel as well as Colin, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, well, that was it. Thanks for being a part of it, Colin. Nice. See, if you wanted to submit something that we could talk about on the show. Like I said, it's not really going to take off until I actually get off my ass and turn this into a podcast, which is tied to making the website project that I already told you about. Give me a break, dude. I just had a baby like eight weeks ago. Um, anyways, when that happens, that would be the right time to uh, get an ad, and I already do have a waiting list, but you know, we, we got a lot of listeners. The community is only growing. I would love to work something out with you if you have something that will work for my community. That's awesome, and I can help you out by telling people about it. So it's a win-win. Get in touch with me if you want to do that kind of thing. We have one commercial spot here and one at the end. But if you watch this far, what we're going to do in the advertising spot that would go at the end is going to be very, very fun. It's a twist ending. You'll have to stick around and see what it is. But... It's good that it happened for this episode because it's an example of being a bellwether. Hopefully. We'll see. It's like a little experiment. That said, jumping back into the topic, let's see. So this idea with being a bellwether in your community, obviously you want to be a member of the community just like everybody else. You're a participant, right? You engage with them, you communicate with them, you post new things, you share things, you comment. You're already a part of that community in some way, right? You're a citizen. You're a good member of that group. Uh, the difference between being just another sheeple and being an actual bellwether in that group is taking action to pursue common goals of people within that group and being sort of a reporter to the group about your own progress, right? So any community you're a part of probably has some kind of activities associated with it, things that you want to do. So I mentioned I was like heavily into motor scooters for a while. I was on a motor scooter forum. People were like modding it, swapping engines, even down to the basics of like, how do I just change the oil in this thing so I don't have to take it to the motorcycle shop and pay more than I pay for my car to have the oil changed. That kind of stuff. And it ranged from like, well, put it on your shop rack for motorcycles from like experts who had that equipment to like how to do it on the budget with stuff you can buy from Home Depot. So for a while, I had a, uh, you need a, a certain kind of tool to open the face of the transmission 
And the tool that I have for opening that is made out of loose parts that are like meant to be connectors of wooden rafters that you can buy at Home Depot and just regular bolts because it's basically it's like two wrenches stuck together like a scissors kind of and I basically just made one that shaped like that out of loose parts how did I learn how to do that by being part of this community someone in there was a bellwether figuring out how to solve these problems on their own and they were sharing it and then other people were imitating them so this guy who invented this tool who knows who it is but then another guy is like, I followed so-and-so's advice. I went to the hardware store. This is how much it cost. Here were the parts. I put it together. Here's me using it. He made a video. Now guess who's being followed as a guy who knows how to do stuff? The guy who made it easier to understand and follow. That's the role of a bellwether that they, some people, again, follow accidentally. But you can do it on purpose. Your goal in being a member of this community, if you want to become a bellwether, is to actually do and pursue the things that the group wants to learn how to do and report back. So if someone's advice is to do XYZ and you document you trying and doing XYZ and you fail, do a postmortem. Figure out why. Was it because of something you messed up or were the instructions flawed in some way? That's valuable information to the community. So the trick with being a bellwether is that unlike a shepherd, you don't wait until you are an expert in this field before you start building an audience around you. You just do what you're doing at the level you're doing it and let other people in on it, and you're going to build a following naturally. I don't even know what that comment means, Zane. Right, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I kind of wanted to give you a... Bellwether, Tinker Bell, Bell of the Ball. I, I, don't, I do not know how all what? of those things <laughs> interrelate. But thanks, Mike. I appreciate the comment. It's probably a funny joke. I just didn't get it. Um, so back to what we're talking about. You are doing just minor things. It can be basic. Start at the level you're at. And the trick is, in any given community, even if it's specifically labeled as this community is for experts or that community is for beginners, really what it has is a spectrum from beginner all the way to expert and what you're seeing are only the people who decide to talk and that doesn't mean you don't have people at either end so for example the cult of copy is positioned as more it's not like beginners are welcome but they're not the ones posting content it's more meant to be people who actually do this for a living talking about it at a very high level of expertise but I know we have beginners because they pop up every once in a while. I'm glad we do. But the thing of it is, like, they're there even though the group is meant to be for more advanced people, right? So in any given community, the point is there's a whole spectrum of levels of experience available. Whatever level of experience you are, there are people in that group with less than you. And even if you haven't done anything yet, the moment you do one project, you are automatically one step ahead of some portion of that community. So even if you're doing the most basic stuff for the very, very first time, there is benefit in broadcasting that out, just being honest about it. Hey, guys, I'm just starting out. Here's what I did. Hopefully it's useful. And if any of the experts in the group have some advice to give, I would love to hear it because I'm going to do this again. Right? You are going to build up a following of all the people just behind you who lacked only the courage to actually take action because you're their hero. Right? Now, not everybody's going to continue to follow you, but you know practice makes perfect. So you're going to continue to practice and do these things. The only difference is you're going to broadcast your experiences as you build them up, right? You are practicing in front of people instead of in secret and then doing a performance when you're already an expert. Instead, you are a living montage like in Rocky IV when Ivan Drago has all like the super modern technology 
that he's working out with and Rocky's like punching meat and dragging ice sleds and doing crazy sit-ups in a frozen barn and whatever other stuff he did. But you're showing people that. Now, what that has the benefit of doing is for people who are members of the community over the same time period that you are, you're creating a living before and after transformation. So in other words, you're sort of like a testimonial for yourself as an expert at whatever it is that you're trying to talk about. Even if people join the community in the future, when you're an expert, if they like what you have to say and they dig, they're going to find that older stuff and they're going to connect with it very, very deeply because they can see that your passion is long term and they can see in you some element of their own level of expertise if you're being honest about where you are and you're broadcasting from that real place. So, of course, they're going to connect with you. It's the same reason that if you're a super advanced expert, you want testimonials from people that your audience can better relate to. But what you're doing here is creating testimonials out of yourself over time that prove that you've become an expert at whatever your thing is because you keep doing it week after week or month after month or whatever the case is, right? You are learning as you go and you're letting people watch you learn as you go. Now what's going to happen, not everyone is going to follow you, right? <coughs> <coughs> All right. Thanks, Mike. Glad to have you on the show. If anyone has some like non-weird comments, that would be sweet too. No offense, Mike. I'm just not getting it. Maybe it's me. Uh, I, I, like I said, we just had a baby. I don't sleep much. Could be me. Uh, um, where was I? Huh. Oh, yes. We were talking about uh, as you grow, not everyone's going to follow you, right? Because there are just some people who are passive participants in any niche, even though there are things to do. They're just like, I'm going to do that one day. Or... I just like to read about it. The example I give people, a lot of times people get mad in my niche, which, like, let's say it's internet marketing, because they're like, how dare that guy teach that thing? He's never done it himself. Or why do people keep buying products? They're never going to do what those products teach them how to do. It's dumb that they're even into it. The comparison I use is like hot rod magazines. Not everyone who subscribes to those magazines is going to build a car from scratch or customize an old jalopy or even own a hot rod. Maybe they just like cars and they drive like a shitty four-door sedan, but they're just into it for entertainment purposes. That niche doesn't denigrate people for just liking it. You know, like some people like comic books, some people like business as a fan. You know, just because you like comic books doesn't mean you want to like draw them. But there's this weird pressure in certain fields where they're like, you can't be a fan of this if you don't actually do it. I say that's nonsense. Don't discourage it. Why not? Like, you can like whatever you want. It doesn't matter if you do it or not. I'm not going to make you feel bad for not taking action. That's up to you. But the reason I bring that up is some portion of your fan audience that's going to follow you, again, you're not saying, hey, guys, I'm the leader. Do what I say. You're just like, here's what I'm doing but you're demonstrating it in a way that's imitatable. So people will naturally imitate you and follow you. So therefore, you are a leader because you have followers, not because you said, hey, I'm the leader. That's why I call it the bellwether effect, because you're leading from the middle. You're just doing stuff and making it easy for people to imitate so they get to watch you get better and therefore want to actually do what you're doing. Now, some portion of your audience, like we said, is going to just not do it. Maybe they'll do one or two things. They'll still think you're awesome because they can see you getting better, but they won't actually do what you do. However, from the very beginning of your odyssey of transformation in this particular niche, you are going to have followers that are going to do everything that you do. And at some point, maybe they'll like break off into being their own bellwether because they'll put their own spin on it and sort of branch off and do their own thing. But the thing is, they are doing what you're doing, which is interacting with the audience in a way that is taking action. And they are right behind you because they followed you from the very beginning. 
what happens when you interact with a niche this way, you end up having skilled and knowledgeable apostles whose only doorway into the niche that you're part of was you. You got them started at the most basic level. They came up with you. They're only one or two levels behind where you're at, but they have nothing but good things to say about you. So now all of a sudden, you don't just have testimonial type stuff. You have endorsement level stuff because if you get to be the expert up here, your closest and oldest followers that have been following you since the beginning are here. Most likely, people already know who those guys are. They're somebodies themselves within that niche. But they're also followers of you. So you can see how this does like a, like a pyramid that puts you at the top, right? But that's all it takes is for you to just continuously be taking self-improving action and getting better and better at reporting it back to an audience in a way that they can copy and imitate. So what I love about this model is that it throws out all of this like, oh, you have to make good how-to material. You need this mixture of content and promotion. You just do it, and the stuff you buy to help you do it that you like, you could probably be an affiliate of that stuff. So you can get paid that way. You build a big enough audience of people imitating what you're doing. Sell advertising. What does that look like? I don't know. I did it like 15 minutes ago. It would look like that. This idea, this model of leading from the middle is immensely powerful. And it happens all the time in ways that you might not think of. For example, um, Olympic heroes these people that are just super dedicated to their sport, but until they hit the Olympic stage, no one knows who they are. No one cares that they spend 120 hours a week doing tumbles or skating or whatever it is. But they hit that stage and they have that like blow you away performance. Now all of a sudden they're a leader. Everyone's imitating them. Everyone's throwing endorsements at them. Like, like why? It's because they didn't say, hey, I'm, I'm the expert. I have all this experience. They just sort of like, I'm a skater. I like to do what I'm doing. So I'm good at it because I do it all the time. I'm really hard on myself about getting better about it. But from that point on, when they have the, the, the attention of the niche on them once they become a figure, then they start getting imitated. And it's not long before someone who is imitating them can outdo them but only because they had them as an example. All I'm talking about is instead of waiting for the world at large or even the powers that be in your particular niche to say, hey, you, we like what you're doing and we want to turn the attention of the niche to you. Don't wait for that. Instead, just start doing what you want to do. Make a plan to do it. Record yourself doing it. Record yourself getting better. Make a record of that. People are like, what do I do for content? I'm like, do something worth writing about. And then it shouldn't be hard to write about. Like, if just do something. If you try to do something, either it worked or it didn't work, you learned something, that's worth reporting back to other people who have not done that thing yet. Because they're sitting there thinking, like, should I do that? I don't know. Is it going to work? Is it going to not work? Will this thing that I want to do work question mark enter like they're gonna find you if you're the person who's actually broadcasting that you did that it's just I, I when I say I live this model it's something I came up with if you know me you know I've talked about this like two or three years ago now maybe the whole growth of the cult of copy over the past two years was me essentially drinking my own cult Kool-Aid as far as I'm going to try and do that, right? Because I was, at the time I started the group, I was still a working copywriter. I had like a reputation. I had done some good jobs, but like I was still doing it for a living. I was still grinding. I was still competing for customers. And the stuff that I talked about in the community were real projects that I was working on in real time, real things that I was learning that were working for me. They weren't like, I've had a storied career for decades, and that's why you should listen to me. 
let's, you know, you just follow me. I'm an expert. I didn't do it that way. I was like, here's what I learned today from being a copywriter today. And people had this visceral, direct response reaction to it because I think they could see me being just a couple of steps ahead of where they wish they were. You know, it's the kind of thing where, like, you don't want to make it seem shallow and callous, but it's like I'm complaining about a problem that they wish they had. You know what I mean? Like, someone who's got no clients wishes they had your nightmare client. But there's something to be said about, like, bragging about your nightmare client and how you're trying to make them happy. There's so much value being delivered to your prospects, to your competitors, the way they see you compared to them, to people who might be your customers in the future based on you teaching things that you know how to do. Just doing this real-time performance over and over so you get better at the content but you also get better at performing and delivering this information in a way that people can connect to. And like I said, you're just doing stuff that you would already want to do, that you're already interested in. All you're doing is broadcasting it out so the people that don't have the courage to do it yet have an example that they can line up behind and just do exactly what you just did. And it'll be cool because they saw you do it and you made it look easy. If you can do it, they can do it. Why do you think I look this way? It's because people are like, if, if that weirdo can do this stuff, he can't be that smart. i got to be able to do that same stuff too. Um, that's part of the reason why I look the way that I do is because the audience reacted to it, so I kept it going. They're like, hey, I like your beard. I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm a beard dude now. Sounds stupid. Totally, what's growing a beard I have to do with copywriting? I don't know. But people liked it, so we continued that conversation, and now, like, I see other marketers with beards. I didn't invent beards. I'm not saying I'm a trendsetter, but I'm saying it's happening. That's all. So, that is all the content I have for this episode. I'm going to have Jane, Zane, uh, not Jane. Your name is exactly between Tarzan and Jane. I don't know if you realize that. So, that as a Tarzan more, fan... It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> As a Tarzan fan, I look at him like, Zan, no, Jane. <laughs> it's Zane. Sorry. Zane's going to check and make sure uh, we don't have any questions before we do the special twist ending that I talked about because we were right up at the end of the show. It will occupy the space that a commercial would normally occupy. But, uh, Zane, we got any questions or anything? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, the Facebook group right now because I don't see anything on the uh, – on the YouTube page, so uh, nothing on the event page either. So uh, it looks like we are good to go to roll into our special twist ending. <laughs> um, I want to make sure you can see me doing stuff over here. Just give me yeah. give me a minute. Sing a little song or something. I don't know. Just like one. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so just one song, okay? It, it it'll make sense in a moment when you see what I'm gonna do. Right. So we've uh. Ah, here's the, the, the cult of copy. Let's see if we can find the, uh, the post here. Oh, there we go. Let's All see. right, so some of you may be aware of uh, this thing that uh, is sort of making the buzz on the Internet called the Ice Challenge. Now, the thing with the Ice Challenge, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's meant to be like a viral popularity generator, usually for a charitable cause. What it's going around for right now is ALS. I'm not even going to pretend to know what ALS stands for because it's very hard to pronounce, which is probably why it's more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Lou Gehrig being a famous baseball player uh, who contracted this disease. What the disease is, it's a motor, a, a progressively degenerative, degenerative motor neuron disease, meaning your brain stops talking to your muscles, so you eventually lose control of the things that you would normally willingly control, your arms, your legs, things like that, but eventually it stops the things that just happen automatically, like your heart beating or your lungs working, so eventually you die, and there's uh, no cure yet from what I know, but they continue to research it because it does affect millions of people around the world. 
what this ICE challenge going around for right now is to raise awareness and raise money for researching a cure for ALS. So if you go to ALS, uh, I'm sorry, ALSA.org for the ALS Association, there's a button right at the top where you can donate. Um, the picture Zane is showing you right now uh, has a picture of the ICE challenge, but you can see the big red donate button right there. You can give them money to help support this cause. Now what the ICE challenge is, is someone calls you out and says basically I want you to do the ice challenge which is to dump a bucket of ice and water over your own head on camera or else donate a hundred bucks to this charity right so you publicly tag your friends and call them out Anthony Aries a buddy of mine who uh, hopefully I'm gonna see in a couple of weeks at the JV Zoo event he's the one who challenged me to this particular thing and you have 24 hours to accept and what I'm going to do is something a little different because it just so happened that he did it within the time frame of me doing my show. So I'm going to do the ice challenge in that I'm going to make the $100 donation and I'm going to dump a bucket of ice water over my head in a minute here. What I had to pause for there is I dumped the ice into the bucket at the beginning of the show and it froze into a giant block and I wanted to make sure I don't knock myself out when I dump this ice water over my head in a second so I busted up the ice some more. But what I'm not going to do is name specific people for the challenge because this has been around my particular little tight circle of friends. They've all already done it. All the people I would want to nominate have all already done it. So what I'm doing for you, if you're watching this show, I'm going to extend it to more than 24 hours, I'll say, over the course of the whole weekend. You can accept the ice challenge yourself watching this show if you do a video response to this video of me doing it, I am going to match a hundred dollar donation up to a thousand bucks. So if ten more people do it besides me, I'm gonna give them a thousand bucks. I would love to be able to do that. I want to generate more publicity about it. Let's do it, right? I don't have anybody specific to call out, but I'm sure at least ten of you, hopefully, will come forward and do a video response to this doing the ice challenge yourself. So my name is the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin D. Terrio. This has been the Cult of Copy Show, episode 17. Cultofcopy.com if you want to join us. YouTube.com slash cultofcopy if you want to subscribe to the show and see past episodes. Now I'm going to do the ice challenge. So, uh, uh, Colin, you may want to make sure and take your headset off. Yes. So <laughs> I'm on camera here. Here we go. That's it for this week. Thanks, everybody.